Do you have your Bibles and like to read the first three verses again of the first chapter of the book of Hebrews? Hebrews 1, verses 1 through 3. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the ages, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. The book of Hebrews is about Jesus, and these messages are about Jesus. The first verse tells us, by way of review, that God spoke, spoke in sundry times and divers manners, in many different times and different ways, but he spoke. As this verse came to my remembrance today, I was thankful that God had spoken. I looked around the world, and I saw the sorrow and the tragedy and the heartbreak that there is in this world. It seems like even the last places where civilization has reserved for themselves, like the Olympics, tragedy has struck again. The world seems to be clothed in tragedy, disaster, doom, sorrow, anguish. And I thought, what would life be and what would this world be if God had never spoken? And suddenly this verse became more precious to me than ever before, that God had spoken. He did not leave us here in this darkness. He did not leave us here in this, this agony of life. God has spoken. He spoke in many ways and in many times. He spoke to Adam. He spoke to the prophets. He spoke to the kings. He spoke to men who, filled with the Spirit of God, wrote down his words and passed them on to others. But the most important thing that God said, he said in his Son, I notice I did not say that the most important thing he said, he said by his Son or through his Son, but he said in his Son. Jesus is God's message to man. Jesus is God's word to the human race. All God wanted to say and all God wanted to reveal to us, he has said and revealed to us in Christ. Again, I'm not emphasizing the words of Jesus. It is the person of Christ by whom God has spoken. Like some great event takes place and we analyze the event and say, what does the event teach us or what does it say? We get a message from that event. So the event of the Lord Jesus entering the human race, dying for sinners, being raised again and exalted to the majesty of God's right hand, God said something in all of that to each of us. God spoke. And when he literally spoke to man, he spoke in the person of his son. And he said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And he referred to this son as his word. So that anything the son was, God was. And anything the son said, God said. Anything the son promised, God promised. And anything that the Son did, God did. And the destinies of each of us for eternity hinge on our interpretation of what God said when he spoke to us in Christ. The most important thing in this world for you and for me, the only thing worth discovering and the only thing worth knowing is if there's a God and whether or not that God has spoken to us and what he has said. Now, God has spoken. And everything he has said, he said in Christ. And then Paul goes from this glorious statement of God speaking to us in the person of Christ to a description of the Lord Jesus. I told you how men marveled over the seven wonders of the world. 
and I'm hearing every day the accomplishment of the great athletes of our time. And as you scan the pages of history, you're awed by the tremendous deeds of history's heroes. Always we are contemplating the greatness of men, the greatness of things, but the Lord Jesus Christ so far surpasses all men and all things that there is no language known to any of us tonight that could properly tell his glory or sing his praise. When Paul was caught up in the paradise in the third heavens, he said he heard unspeakable things not lawful for a man to utter. And he meant simply by that, not that he had been forbidden of the Lord to say what he had seen, but as long as he was earthbound, and as long as he was still in his body of death, and as long as he was limited to this tongue of clay, it would be impossible to ever speak forth what he had seen. You know the speechlessness that comes over you when you stand beside some great beauty of nature like the Grand Canyon or the ocean for the first time? How could you describe it to those who had never seen it? No words can describe it. In fact, there's a, a twinge of sorrow in my heart at, at each experience like that. The sorrow of being able to see and comprehend so much and the sorrow of telling so little and the inability to pass it on to someone else I love. So it is with Paul, he had seen the Lord and he had had some comprehension of what he was all about and who he was and what God had said to him. And if this is a complete description of the Lord Jesus Christ, then we're really hurting because it's a very brief, very sketchy outline of what he is and who he is, but it's the seven wonders of the Lord Jesus himself. And I guess if you could call the messages, this one and the last one, anything, you could call them messages on wonderful Jesus. Because the prophet said before he ever entered the human race, that thou shalt call his name wonderful. And those who have come to know him know how wonderful he really is. That's why we sing, wonderful, wonderful Jesus. Who can compare with thee? And here is Paul's song, wonderful Jesus. And here he seeks to exalt him and tell who he is and why he is greater than the prophets of old and why even though God had spoken to the Old Testament prophets he had never said what he said in Christ and he tries to tell why he is greater than the angels and greater than Joshua and greater than Moses and greater than the law and greater than the covenants greater than everything that God had ever done or everything that God had ever said to man Jesus was greater far greater superior to all of these things that thus revealed to man so he begins by telling us that the Lord Jesus Christ had been appointed the heir of all things. And therefore, everything in the universe, everything in nature, everything in creation, everything that was made by him, he has become the sole heir to all of it. The unsearchable riches of God are his inheritance. No human being has any comprehension of what is hidden in that phrase, the unsearchable riches of Christ because the riches of Christ his inheritance from God has never yet been fully known and has never yet been fully searched it is fathomless it reaches beyond eternity yet to come it encompasses all that God is all that God has been and all that God will be throughout the coming eternal age and Jesus is the rightful heir of all. He gave up this heirship when he entered the human race. Coming through the manger of Bethlehem, he laid it all aside with the insignia of his majesty, with the outward manifestation of his glory. He relinquished every claim and every right and every privilege, and he came into the human race to live as a man in the power of the Holy Spirit subject to his Father to do his will. And not one time in the 33 years did he ever claim for himself the rights he had, lawful rights, as the Son of God. Laying aside his inheritance, giving it up for us, he came to be made like us. 
that he might learn firsthand our sorrows and carry our griefs, that he might be wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities, that he might be chastised for our peace, that he might stand in our place with God and be dealt with for us, and laying aside everything that he had had and everything that he was, he was plunged into separation from God in the outer darkness alone. And God raised him from among the dead and glorified him with a glory that he had shared once before the foundation of the world and gave him a name that he had never known, for the name was greater now than any name named in heaven or on earth or beneath the earth. And he owned him as his very own begotten son, not that he had just begun then, nor that that was the beginning of his generation, but he was the only one in all creation that he could own as a son and seat with him in his majesty on high. And he did this, and at that time he appointed him to be your heir of all things. And as I told you in the message before last, one of the most precious things I know about that is that he did not become like most heirs become who inherit a fortune, selfish and self-centered. The Lord Jesus shared that inheritance with us. For we're now called joint heirs. Now remember, I told you the distinction between equal heirs and joint heirs. Equal heirs at the death of the one who leaves the inheritance get an equal part of what's left at that time. But joint heirs have the inheritance kept intact for them in an estate. And it is administered to each of the joint heirs mutually and for their good. And Jesus says that we are joint heirs with him. And Peter says that our inheritance is being kept in heaven for us where moth can't get in to corrupt it, or rust, where thieves can't break in to steal it. And we ourselves, Peter says, are being kept for the inheritance by the power of God, so that someday in the portals of glory and in the courts of heaven, God will administer for our eternal good the inheritance that belongs to us and Jesus together. No man knows what that includes. No man knows the glories and the splendors of that inheritance. Eye has never seen it, and ear has never heard it, and it has never once entered into any of our minds what is yet in store for those who love him and those he loves. That's a powerful verse, you know, in 2 Corinthians 2. Powerful because it seems like there have been an awful lot of things entered into our minds about what eternity is going to be like. And we're always preaching about it. The preachers like to tell you what heaven will be like and what it will be like to be in heaven. But here in this verse we are told that it has never yet entered into the mind of man. The things that are yet in store are yet to be revealed. And I take that verse to mean, starting now, covering all of eternity in the unfolding of the ages to come, the revelation of his glory, the revelation and the unfolding of his inheritance, of his goodness, his kindness, and his love to us in Jesus Christ, has never entered our mind what it's really all about yet. We have a meager, meager conception described by Paul as looking through a glass very darkly, described as reading but having a veil over our face, the finite trying to fathom the infinite that cannot be and it will not be until he comes and we're made like him and his wonderful Jesus sits down with us and shares with us his inheritance. Not only has he been appointed the heir of all things, Paul owns him here as the creator. He says, by whom also he made the ages, the Greek says. All the happenings of history all of the events of time and space were framed by him. History is really his story. History is the unfolding of his will, the outworking of the divine will. It is Jesus who moves men as pawns upon the stage of time. 
It is his faithful hand upon the governments of this world that move international situations into their fulfillment. It is him who will gather the kings of the earth together at the battle of Armageddon that he might reveal himself to them. It is him who has his ministers everywhere ministering in his behalf and speaking to men, ordering governments, raising up kings and taking down rulers. All history is the unfolding of the will of the Lord Jesus Christ. And all of the events of time are on an eternal timetable. And Paul speaks of him as being the brightness, the brightness of his glory, the flashing forth, of all of the attributes of God, the stamped figure, the express image of his person, the upholder of all things. And I can't help but touch on that again tonight. Jesus is not only upholding all things, but remember I told you he's not like Charles Atlas holding the world up by his strength. This word means that he is not only sustaining all things in creation, but he is propelling it forward and moving it onward according to his own plan so that everything in his creation is in movement as science tells us and all of this movement is being worked by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ the word implies that he is guiding all of creation he is piloting it along its chosen course and it gives me lots of rest to know Jesus is the pilot of our creation and he is the pilot of this civilization and he is the one who is guiding all mankind to their eternal destiny. Those who have been washed in his precious blood he is bringing surely and certainly as a shepherd brings his sheep into the presence of his father to present him with glory and honor and praise. And just as surely he is bringing along those who have rejected him to the great white throne of judgment where he himself will be revealed in the glory of his Father. The whole human race and all of matter is being sustained and guided and piloted by the hand of the Lord Jesus, the hand that was marked at Calvary. It's the hand you can trust. You're in good hands, in Jesus' hands. And Paul speaks of him upholding all things by the word of his power so that, as I told you before, the forces of nature are really the outworking of his will. All of matter now moving in his charted course, moving by his power. All the change that takes place in us and the change that takes place in the creation around us all according to his divine turn timetable. And now we come to the greatest wonder of all, a wonder so great that I believe that the human heart could believe all of these previous things about Jesus before it can grasp this one. I believe that the unsaved man can accept him as the creator before he can accept him as the savior. And I believe he must in that order. The unsaved man would not stagger at the thought of Jesus being the pilot and the guide of all the universe. But oh, what a wonder this is. And a wonder that can only be revealed to the heart of man by the power of the Holy Spirit himself. A wonder that no mind, no intelligence can lay hold of. Only the heart with help of the Holy Spirit, with faith created down deep inside of us to simply believe God and take him in his word, only that heart can lay hold of this tremendous wonder of the Lord Jesus. The wonder of it is that he being the creator, the father of the ages, the brightness of the glory of God, the express image of the eternal one, the heir of all things, this blessed one would leave his place of exaltation, his place of majesty, his place of glory, his place that he held for an eternity past, and come by the way of Bethlehem's humiliation 
simply to purge us of our sins. This is the greatest wonder of all, that Jesus would lay everything aside, lay everything down, give everything up, renounce all that he was and all that he possessed by rights to purge me of my sins. Now, that's not much of a statement here, only about six or seven words. He by himself purged our sins. There's more implied than just meets the eye. There's a word picture. The word picture is this, the creator, the upholder of all things that he had created, had been challenged. A challenge had entered into his creation. That challenge was sin. For sin separated from him those he had made for his pleasure. And the challenge of sin entering into his creation became his personal responsibility. And the Greek grammar implies that for his own benefit and for his own interest, he personally arose from his place in glory to tend to this challenge which had come in his creation. The very right of God to love man and the right of man to love him in return had been challenged. The joy of God in revealing himself to man and his purposes had been thwarted. Sin had come in and like a veil had separated man from himself, had clothed his creation in death, had brought a curse upon every living thing that he created for his pleasure and his joy. put everything down and subjected everything to that bondage of death and to the curse of sin. And there must be one who will rise to the challenge, one who is able, one who is willing. And that one who is willing and that one who is able was Jesus. And it was Jesus who by himself purged our sin. And there's also significance in the fact that the word is that he had by himself done it. It implies that he acted in his own interest and he acted upon him, his own self in doing this. He did it willfully, he did it of his own volition. But it also implies that it was a work in which he could have no help. God the Father couldn't help him God the Holy Spirit couldn't help him. Angels couldn't help him. Man couldn't help him. Isaiah wrote of it years before he came and said that when he would tread the winepress of the wrath of God, there would be no man with him. He said he must go into that winepress alone. And the emphasis here in this verse, I think, falls upon this fact that he had by himself purged us of our sins. Years ago, I always thought I wanted to write something on the subject of the discipline of loneliness. Because loneliness is a discipline that God works in the hearts of all these people. In some hearts he does it in a greater degree than in others. But it's a discipline all of us must know because Jesus was lonely. He was lonely because he was cut off from his father. In his loneliness, he was cut off from life. He was cut off. The Jews even said he'd been cut off in his death without a seed. He made a shame in the sight of God, for he died without child. But the loneliness that the Lord Jesus experienced didn't begin at Gethsemane, and it didn't end at Calvary particularly. It began when he first left heaven's glory and entered into the human race. For he came alone, and he must do his work alone, and he must go back alone. 
No one came with him from the glory, though the angels came as far as they could and revealed themselves to the shepherds, singing glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill among men. But when he came to Bethlehem, he came all by himself. There wasn't a soul on this earth who understood him. There wasn't a soul who could enter into the Holy of Holies of his heart and share with him the agonies and sorrows that he bore. There wasn't a man, woman, boy, or girl on the earth who could put their arm around his shoulder and say, I understand. There wasn't a man who could shake his hand and say, Brother, I know what you're going through. There wasn't a one who could pray intelligently for him, nor minister to him to any degree of success. He came into this world alone, a solitary, eternal traveler, who came without help and who left without hope. For when he died, he cast himself into eternal loneliness in separation from God and was cut off, crying, My God, my God, as though he were saying, Why hast even thou forsaken me? He was refused and rejected of men, hated, called a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and there's a little insight in the Old Testament scriptures of the loneliness that he experienced in carrying our sorrows and griefs later at the cross being wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. Some of the Messianic Psalms are touching in this regard because they give some of his heart thoughts, especially the one touches me of how in his very own home where he should have found a place of honor, where he should have been loved, where if anyone on earth could have ministered to him, the members of his family should have. He talks of how he had gone to his room alone and wept in the night, with his face turned to the wall, for there was none who could understand, none who could help, none who could lift the load, none who could minister to his grief. Though angels came when he was in Gethsemane, they soon left, for he had come to purge me of my sin. And he had to do it by himself. By himself. What does it mean to be purged? The word means to be purified. It means to wash. It means to cleanse. It means to make pure. And I confess I don't understand all I know about this. But I understand enough about the words to know that whatever he did at the cross of Calvary and whatever he suffered in his life, his death, his burial, and his resurrection, that whatever he came from his place of created glory to do, and whatever it cost him, the end result to me is that I have been purged of my sins, cleansed of my sins, washed of my sins made pure of my sins where once I was defiled. It puts no limitation in time on my sins. It doesn't say sins that are past. It just says my sins. Whatever sins are mine. God doesn't go by calendar, nor does he operate by watch. God sees us now in eternity, and the sins he speaks of are the sins of all time. He sees my past, my present, my future, all of them sins in the sight of God purged now from those sins. I'm washed and clean and pure and acceptable in his sight because Jesus by himself did this for me. That's the gospel. Now, I don't really comprehend that. I don't really comprehend it because though my conscience is purged of sin and though I come to God with boldness and full assurance that my sins are forgiven me for his name's sake and even though the Holy Spirit does no longer condemn me for my sins still I'm in this flesh and I still see with these eyes of flesh how many, many sins there really are and were and will be before I'm made like him. And I'm overwhelmed sometimes with the magnitude of my sins. 
so that I don't think I'll ever fully grasp until we're in the presence of the Lord what it means when God tells me that he has fully purged me from my sins because he himself came to do this for me. This was no joint endeavor. He didn't say to the angels, let us go and purge man from their sins. Nor did he say to the seraph or the cherubim, let us band together and with our power together we will purge man of his sins. He said, I must go and I must go alone. And the father let him go and he came. And he lived 33 years. The sorrows and the anguish of those years we'll never know until we see him and hear from his own lips the sorrows of the way of life. But in those 33 years, as hard as it is for us to grasp, he experienced every tragedy, every heart pang, every heartbreak, every sorrow that any human being who ever lived ever experienced. And it isn't any wonder then that he was old before his time physically. That he looked 50 when he was yet 30 years old. No wonder that he was nicknamed Man of Sorrows, for it showed in his face. He came alone to be acquainted with us, to learn about our sorrows and our griefs, to tabulate our sins, and to bear them all upon his own shoulders to the cross of Calvary, where he would take them upon his soul and be made those sins and sin for us, that we in exchange might be made the righteousness of God. And the greatest wonder of all that I know about Jesus, we sing it in that song, is that Jesus loved me. I can believe that he's the creator. I believe that he must uphold and sustain all things. I know he's the express image of God and the brightness of his glory. I know he's the appointed heir of all. But oh, what a tremendous thing it is to know in my heart and to believe that this same Jesus, this great one, this wonderful one, loved me and loved me enough to come by himself to what awaited him that he might purge me of my sins. The blood of Jesus Christ, John writes, cleanseth us, purges us, washes us, from all sins. And John wrote, Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. And the taking away phrase in the original language implies that where once sin had had a part and found a place, because of Jesus' work at the cross, sin has no more place and no more part in me. I am crucified with Christ, yet I live. Yet it isn't me who really lives. It's Christ who lives in me. And the life that I seem to live here now in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. For God sees me purged, made clean and cleansed and purified and holy in his sight and as acceptable as the Lord Jesus Christ is because of this thing that he did by himself. For me, And the Greek also bears out the fact that it was a once and for all act, a single, definite, historical transaction whereby Jesus by himself purged me from all my sins. And I'll tell you this, it's the only purgatory that the Bible knows anything about. And the only purgatory that ever can take away man's sins. You know, the Catholics teach that there is a purgatory. And we are told that when man dies, he must stay in hell until he has been purged of his very last sins. And so it's important, they say, that we confess our sins to the priest and live as godly and holy a life as we can for... The more godly and more holy we live, the less time we shall spend in purgatory, in pain and anguish, and in the very flames of hell. It's all a lie. Jesus went to purgatory for me. He descended into that pit and into the flames and into the outer darkness, and he stayed until he had purged me of all my sins. 
The only purgatory known in this book is the purgatory of the cross. And it is where Jesus descended into hell itself, lay silent under the wrath of God, became the smiting place at the altar and the sacrifice before God. And there he, by himself entering into the awesome presence of God in judgment, did for me what no pope, no priest, no cardinal, no church, no doctrine, no man can do. He purged me from my sins once and forever by a single definite historical act and sent his Holy Spirit to witness in my heart that I was now as acceptable to God as he himself. David knew about this in prophecy because in his 51st Psalm, which I've often called his Psalm of Repentance, after his sin with Bathsheba and God had sent Nathan in grace to him to convict him of his sin, to show him his wrong and bring him to repentance. The 51st Psalm, I believe, was his prayer that he prayed to God when he cried out, In thy sight and in thy sight only have I sinned. And he begged God for his forgiveness and he begged him not to take from him the joy of his salvation. And he cried out, Purge me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Purge me with hyssop. And that's too detailed to go into, but it spoke of the cross and the hope of David's heart that God would find a way to purge him of his sin through the death of his son. And God did find a way. For Jesus came by himself to not only purge me, but to purge David, and to purge you, and to purge all who will come to God by him. The passage in the Old Testament I like real well is the sixth chapter of Isaiah. Isaiah was a prophet of God, and he was a holy man. And he was used to walking with the Lord and talking with the Lord. And one day, he had an experience, if you want to call it that. It was in the, in the year that King Uzziah died. He made a mental note of it. It was an important thing that happened to him in his life. He saw the Lord. And even though he was a prophet and even though he was anointed of God and even though he was a holy man in his walk before the Lord, when he saw the Lord, he said, High and lifted up. He cried out of the agony of his heart, Oh God, I am an unclean man. And I dwell in the midst of unclean people. And I like that because it's one of God's principles. The more we see of him, the more we see of ourselves and others. The more we see the holiness of God, the more we see what sinners we really are. And this holy man of God, one glimpse of the Lord in all of his glory, said, I saw him high and lifted up. And he talked about his train and the living creatures that were telling of his glory and his praise in heaven. And Isaiah took one look and he said, I'm an unclean man. I have unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of an unclean people. And he cried out to God and he said, Oh God, purge me. Purge me. Make me clean. Purify me. Wash me. Make me holy. That's what he wanted. Make me like you. And God answered him and he sent an angel from heaven. And the angel brought from heaven a coal. And he took it off the altar of heaven where a fire was burning and never went out. And he brought that coal from that altar in heaven and he touched the lips of that man. And he said, Now thou art purged from thy sins. And that altar in heaven is the cross. It was the fulfillment of the brazen altar of sacrifice in the tabernacle. Where day after day Week after week and month after month, the priest offered to God some acceptable sacrifice and offering for men. And the angel that came from heaven and brought that coal from that altar in the presence of God and touched the lips of that man who longed to be purged and announced with heaven's authority, Thou art now purged from thy sins, was giving us a story and a picture of the gospel as it is made known to us. The cross of Calvary is still there. That altar is there. And the flame of that sacrifice will never go out. 
And there is a call on that altar for the lips of every man and every woman, every boy and every girl who ever lived. And all a man has to do to know the purging of his sins is to long to be purged and want to be purged. And God will send an angel from heaven, a messenger, who will show him how to apply personally to his own lips and heart the sufficiency and the efficacy of the Lord Jesus' perfect sacrifice. He came by himself to do this, and when he had done it, the Bible says that he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. The Greek implies that it was a solemn seating, one of dignity, formal, it was like the coronation of a king, crowning of a sovereign. All heaven's courts must have come to complete silence as the Son of God returned from his mission, appointed heir by God first over all things, and then that wonderful proclamation made, sit here at my right hand, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. I've owned you as my very own. Sit here in my majesty, in my throne on high. Be seated now. Why was he seated? Well, he was seated because he finished his work. In the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings, where we are told about God's creation of things, when he recreated the earth, made a place for man on it, tells the different things that he did in the six days of creation and on the seventh day it says he rested from all his works. He rested not because he was tired but because he was finished. He looked upon all that he had made and he said it was good. Having nothing more to do, having no challenge in all his creation to meet, he set himself down in perfect rest and in perfect peace and the seventh day became a hallowed day a day of rest for God himself. He was at rest because sin had not entered into his creation. He was at rest because Satan had no upper hand. He was at rest because everything in his creation was subject to him, including the man he had made and placed in his garden. And God rose from his rest the day that the serpent enticed Eve, and through her temptation, Adam plunged the human race into sin. And God has been working since that day until the day of Calvary when he finished his works. And when he was raised again from the dead and brought into the presence of his Father and looked around and saw the mercy seat sprinkled with his own blood, the pleasure written on the face of his Father, he could say as he had once said, it is good. And so he sat down and rest because there isn't a challenge that hasn't been met in the cross of Calvary. Even the head of the serpent has already been crushed. His days are numbered. He hath but a short time. And the creation lost to Satan and to sin by the fall of Adam has been reclaimed by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords as his very own. He's seated there because he finished with his work. And I suppose that the most significant thing I learned when I first studied the tabernacle years ago was the surprise I had in discovering that there was no chair in it because I read about the continuous labors of the priests. They labored night and day in the tabernacle. The seven-tiered golden candlestick had to burn continuously. Showbread had to be fresh upon the, table of golden, uh, the golden table of showbread. The altar of incense had to be dealt with daily. The sacrifice, sacrificial fire on the brazen altar was never to go out. So the priests were continually working, continually working, continually working. And I wondered where they sat down when they got tired. They never sat down because their work was never finished. They offered one sacrifice after another, one offering after another, one prayer after another, one plea after another with God that man might be in an acceptable position with him. But when our high priest came from heaven's glory to the brazen altar of the cross, made a sacrifice that was sufficient and acceptable in the sight of God, he finished his work and sat down, or he would never make another sacrifice. 
Nor would he ever go to the Holy of Holies again to present any blood to the mercy seat. The blood had been sprinkled. It was eternal, unique. God had accepted us, and we had been purged. And he had won this eternal redemption by himself and sat down from all his labors to prove that God accepted him, his sacrifice, and us. And what's he doing now? He's sitting there. That's what he's doing. He's on the right hand of the majesty on high. All things are in his hands. He sits there, first of all, to save men. The Bible says that he will save to the uttermost all who come to God by him. And he adds that he is able to do this saving to the uttermost because... He's able to make an endless intercession for them. So he intercedes for sinners saved by grace, and he sits there awaiting those who would come to God by him. Able to save to the uttermost. The Greek says, save to the all end. Save through life, through sickness, through health, through death. Save through the troubles and the sorrows and the trials of life saved from our sins, saved from the power of sin, saved from Satan, saved from hell, saved from God's judgment, saved for God's eternal glory and praise, saved to the uttermost, because he sits there tonight at the right hand of the majesty on high. And as he is accepted, I am accepted. As he is welcome there, I am welcome. I am purged as he is purged, holy as he is holy, and I am as he is tonight, in the eye, in the mind, and in the heart of the eternal God. Oh, how much the devil wants me to believe otherwise, and how much the flesh tells me it is not so. But God has spoken. He spoke, and he spoke in his son. And this is what I heard him say. And this is what I believe he said. And this is what gives me peace in my heart tonight, to know that God is on his throne, Jesus is at his right hand, and I am here, but not forever. Because the Bible tells us that God said to him in that day, Be seated here at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And Jesus said when he was upon the earth that there would come a time when he would rise and shut the door, the door of salvation, and he would enter out from the presence of God and make himself known to the people again. You know, the high priest, when he went into the Holy of Holies once a year to present the blood upon the sacrificial altar, no human being was allowed in the Holy of Holies with him. He had to go alone. And he could only go once. And after he took the blood in to sprinkle it on the mercy seat, the people waited in the outer court. They waited with bated breath because they longed to have a word from their priest that God had accepted his sacrifice and they could rejoice now in the forgiveness of their sins until another day of atonement. And they were so fearful that this priest would die while in the presence of God but there is a legend that the Jews used to tie a rope around him so in case he died they could pull him out through the great veil and none would be smitten with death for going into the Holy of Holies. And he wore on the bottom of his high priestly garments of glory a bell and then a pomegranate and then a bell and then a pomegranate and these golden bells sounded all the time that he was in the Holy of Holies. The people of God couldn't see him and they couldn't be sure that he was in there, excepting they heard something continually. And it was the testimony of the golden bells at the fringe of his garment. And as long as those bells rang, they were at rest, for their high priest was in the presence of God, making an acceptable sacrifice for them, and all was well. Now our high priest has gone inside the veil. He'll come out again, but he hasn't come yet. We cannot see him there. We're not allowed to visit in the Holy of Holies except by faith. But we know he's there. 
from the Holy of Holies comes the continual witness of the Holy Spirit to our hearts. But the high priest is there. making an endless intercession for us. All is well. God is hearing him. The blood is speaking better things than that of Abel's. He has purged us from our sins. He's at the majesty of God's right hand, and we will be soon. For when he has made his enemies to be his footstool, he will come out. And to those of us who wait in the outer court, he will show himself, exhibit himself. Remember the message not long ago? He will show himself, appear, apart from sin, under salvation. And that salvation that he has yet to reveal to us, as you well know, is the change we all groan for tonight, the one we long for in our bodies, to be made like him and see him as he really is. And oh, the wonder of it all has never yet entered our mind, nor been seen with our eyes or heard with our ears. Only the witness of the Holy Spirit that it is so. God has spoken. And he spoke to us in his son. This is what he said. Have you heard him? Let's pray. Father, what can we add to what you have said? This is your word. And you have spoken to us in your son Jesus. We've heard that message. And we come to you in peace because he shed this precious blood and gave his life by himself for us. We accept his testimony as thy word and we believe it with our hearts. It ministers grace to us this evening. Father, we will never know until we see you the factors that are at work in our life, the pressures of Satan, the flesh, the world, the attacks that come against us daily fightings without and fears within, trembling in the inner man so much, longing for the day when we shall escape this body of death and humiliation and be like Jesus and be with him. Fill us with patience, a patience that works hope. Help us to keep our eyes daily upon the coming of Jesus from that sacred place to take us unto himself. If there should be one here unsaved tonight, Father, we pray for them. Oh, how we pray that they will hear what you have said to them in your Son. They will bow at the blessed feet of Jesus and receive him as their Savior and their Lord. Before they are made to bow their knees and confess with their tongues that he is Lord to the glory of God. Help them to realize that tonight we have the glorious privilege of receiving him in love. But remind each of us that if there are those who have never received him in love, they must someday be compelled to bow their knees, confess what they will not confess now, that Jesus is Lord, to your glory and praise. We long for many of these precious souls in this building to be in your presence when we see Jesus. Father, impress upon them how much you love them, how much Jesus loves them, and how much I love them, and how much we need to love each other. In Jesus' precious name we pray and for his sake. Amen. Lord bless you.